medicine room. Barbell medicine going nationwide, not worldwide, nationwide first. But it's gonna be cool. We're going to get hair and makeup because she said I wasn't pretty enough. <laughs> Sit with me. And what was your name one more time? Jordan. Jordan, Randy. Randy, nice to meet you. It's my first time wearing makeup on oh purpose. Oh boy, uh, on purpose. Well, you know. I think I've had some trace lipstick on this. Well, there. <laughs> but it, you hadn't applied it. Yeah, right. It was applied to you. It was a, yeah, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do? What are you here for? Um, we'll talk about exercise and medicine. Oh, that. So. Is that good for you? Uh, yeah, exercise. <laughs> I think. I maybe mean, not. <laughs> First, so I didn't. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to put it on? I guess your hair doesn't get you like that. Yeah. It's okay. I think so. It's great. Oh my god. Yeah. You don't want to put it on your suit jacket. I'm just going to have audio come and mic you up in your dressing room. Okay, sure. All right. Thank you. About to get mic'd up. This is cool. Please welcome Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum to the show. All right, hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Barbell Medicine YouTube channel. I'm Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum. This is training blog number 25. We've got a bunch of questions from you guys, form checks that you've submitted, and also some of our own training. Stay tuned to the end of the video to figure out how to submit your own training video or question for upcoming training blogs. So let's hop right into it. The first question is from Jordan Roscoe. He asks, should I reduce my training volume during the weight loss phase? No. <laughs> if so, by how much? You shouldn't. Uh, would this weight loss be counterproductive to increasing my lean mass and strength? over my long-term training span. Yes, losing weight would be counterproductive to gaining lean body mass uh, while you're losing weight. Long-term, hard to say because it depends how you're going to um, you know, change that, what your long-term strategy is gonna be and other parameters that are specific to your uh, given uh, situation right now. So here, look, weight loss, yes, compromises lean body mass gain, just in general. Uh, I don't imagine you're gonna be losing weight forever. So, you know, your long-term progress may not be uh, impaired. If And if you need to lose weight right now due to a health reason, um, then I think long-term training outcomes are likely to be better when you're healthier compared to less healthy. Uh, and it's likely that you can still gain some lean body mass whilst losing weight, just it's compromised um, compared to if you were gaining weight, right? Uh, so the other thing I'd wanna say on this is that, let's say you were really thrown off by that. And you were like, I wanna gain weight um, because I want to maximize my lean body mass gain. Like how much lean body mass can I gain in, let's say a month? It's not that much. Um, some people will say you can gain 10 pounds, 15 pounds, 20 pounds of lean body mass in a month or two months or even three months. And I would say, you know, citation desperately needed. That's not something that we've seen in, in the research, even when people are supplementing with super physiological doses of testosterone or other anabolic steroids. That's not what you see. You see things like, you know, two kilos of muscle of lean body mass as, uh, as measured by DEXA or hydrostatic weighing, that's the dunk tank, you know, over two months or three months, uh, sometimes up to four kilos, you know, but still that's eight pounds in three months. Uh, so I don't think it's a good idea to rapidly gain body weight on, uh, uh, on the quest for gaining just lean body mass or mostly lean body mass for most folks. I think if you're underweight and strength is the most important thing to you, um, you know, that's another discussion for another day. You could theoretically gain a little bit of uh, weight a little bit faster, but I still don't think that a rapid weight gain is, is likely a, a good strategy for most folks, especially if you're considering losing weight. Um, and then as far as when you should cut volume, I think that volume needs for your strength training uh, portion of your programming needs to go down during times when you're peaking or, or times when you are deloading or something like that. Otherwise, I think that cutting volume because you're reducing calories is probably uh, 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 the wrong move. You may find that um, during periods of higher stress, which can come from you know a high dietary <laughs> RPE, as Austin and I kind of talk about. Basically, dieting can be can uh, require you to use a lot of uh, you know mental and psychological uh, resources, and so it's a little more stressful. And in that case, using um, you know less fatiguing exercise variations, including machines, dumbbells, stuff like that, over uh, all just barbell training may be useful. But I don't think cutting the absolute volume is a good strategy, especially because that volume of training, especially. Uh, 
as it pertains to conditioning volume um, is likely helpful for burning calories and ultimately helping you lose weight. So I probably wouldn't reduce your volume unless you were peaking and you need to lose a few pounds to go into a meet, in which case you'd be reducing the volume anyway. I think that yes, losing weight is probably not the best way to gain lean body mass, but uh, I think long-term, you know, it's hard to say one way or another. Uh, it just depends on the specific context. I think that if you're losing weight to become healthier right now, that will likely put you in a better situation for long-term training outcomes compared to you know, a situation that if you did not prioritize your health and you just you know, ate with reckless abandon to try to gain a bunch of lean body mass, I don't think that's going to serve uh, nearly anybody very well. Okay, moving on. Next question. <clears throat> it's from Sunny. I had a question. Hey. I started my novice LP around March of this year. The only time I missed sessions were for a holiday where I missed around two weeks in May and then deloaded on my return. I guess it's a vacation. I don't know. I've taken two weeks off. That's all right. Very good. Uh, my current lift figures are squats, uh, 115 kilos, three sets of five deadlift, 127 and a half kilos for one set of five press, 47 kilos for three sets of five and bench 71 kilos for three sets of five. I am finding now that I can no longer increase on the squats and deadlifts by two and a half pound jumps. I have began to microload these and feel like I'm even struggling on these weight increases. The same goes for the press and bench, which I began microloading quite a while ago. I was wondering if I should totally move on from the novice LP now, or could it possibly be form or calorie intake, which is the issue. My height is five foot 10. I weigh 71 kilos, 3000 kilocalories per day. I'm 14 and a half percent body fat. So, uh, good question. Um, I can't see your form from, he from here, and so I, you know, I can't say for sure that that has no uh, bearing on on your, uh, you know, performance outcomes on this particular program. I, I also don't know how much weight that you've gained, but given your height and your weight, if to be the strongest version of yourself, you'll likely have to gain more weight. Now, that being said, I don't expect LP to work for you for a significant period of time longer, even if you are gaining weight because you've already adapted to that amount of stress. Um, similarly, I think that you've been microloading for a long period of time, which suggests that even if you still had, uh, you know, a, a good amount of uh, adaptation that you could glean from this particular program, I think that that started uh, to wane a couple weeks ago when you started microloading. And I, I don't think microloading is a good idea unless you're using calibrated plates anyway, because the variance and tolerance as far as weight goes on the plates and the bar in a commercial gym are likely greater than the amount that you're microloading. So all that is to say, I don't see any reason to stay on the LP. There are multiple other training programs, including the bridge or other offerings from various different places on the internet um, that will, you know, uh, provide progressive overload and, you know, the correct amount of intensity and volume to continue your training progress, but yeah, sure. I'd gain weight, but I just don't think that's going to make your LP last for, you know, months and months longer. That's just not, not what we see typically. So, all right. Next question, Jim Wolf. What do you guys think of the theory that stimulating the parasympathetic nervous system? Uh, oh, the parasympathetic nervous system promotes recovery. For example, if one, if on the one hand, smelling salts or too much caffeine creates an unproductive stress, could it be on the other hand that taking a bath, getting a massage or petting your dog has some benefit? Okay, so what he's asking is that, you know, we commonly talk about using too much caffeine or uh, using smelling salts or something like that uh, causes an increased arousal, increased activation of the sympathetic nervous system. So I don't know if it's, if I would say unproductive stress, I would just say more stress. Uh, unproductive stress would be an increase in stress that does not, uh, you know, c improve your performance or the fitness adaptations that you're seeking um, the same amount that it increases your stress. So I, I don't know if I would say unproductive, but the question is, does, you know, targeting parasympathetic nervous system, which is the rest and di digest sort of arm of the autonomic nervous system, does targeting that improve training outcomes? I think, you know, we got to look at the data here and, and really kind of suss this out. So a lot of sports psychologists will often advocate the use of relaxation skills to athletes and coaches, but there's a lack of data on the efficacy of, uh, you know, any of these interventions that, that, you know, you could commonly um, think about. So that includes progressive muscular relaxation, yoga, you know, deep breathing, breathing exercises, uh, you know, meditation, stuff like that. Uh, a recent systematic review, 2015, um, looking at relaxation techniques and sports performance found that research is far away from providing valid guidelines for this, uh, for the applied field of sports uh, performance and more well-designed trials are needed. And I think that's 
an accurate representation of the literature right now. However, there's a couple studies I actually just wanted to talk about specifically. Um, so one actually shows uh, the benefit of, of uh, breathing exercises or power naps. So this, uh, and, and I'll link these uh, below in the description. Um, so this study is called The Acute Effects of Psychological Relaxation Techniques Between Two Physical Tasks. This was published in the Journal of Sports Science 2017. Basically, they took 27 sports students and they didn't comment on the training level on these sports science students. I assume this that most of them are relatively untrained um, and that the... the uh, test was they did six sprints for four seconds a piece uh, that were separated by 20 seconds. And uh, they did this twice, that whole thing twice, and it was separated by 25 minutes. Now, they had a control arm who did nothing during the 25 minutes. They had a yoga group who did yoga during the 25 minutes. They did a power nap group who took a nap. They did uh, some breathing exercises. Uh, and then another group did progressive muscle relaxation. And then the only two groups that showed some per improvement in performance were the power naps and the uh, uh, breathing exercises. Now, again, they didn't actually, the performance improvement was not that great. It was not that reliable. In fact, if you look at some of the actual individuals' performances um, in those groups, you see people who did way, way better uh, with the breathing uh, and the power naps and then people who actually did worse. But on average, the performance improvement was small versus uh, yoga, which actually they did worse. Uh, the progressive muscle relaxation, they did worse. And the thought was that using those relaxation techniques may require increased time for uh, getting the person more aroused to perform on a subsequent bout. So maybe you wouldn't do that between exercises. Um, still, again, there's not a lot of data that, that validates any of these um, uh, techniques. And they conclude, and I kind of agree with this, all in all, in terms of, relax uh, in terms of relaxation, it remains highly individual and needs to be adjusted per athlete. Oh, duh. Okay. A uh, second study I want to talk about here is, uh, is titled An Evidence-Based Approach for Choosing Post-Exercise Recovery Techniques to Reduce Markers of Muscle Damage, Soreness, Fatigue, and Inflammation, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. So basically, I think what you're asking uh, in general is that are there recovery techniques that we can employ that improve performance? Okay. Now, this particular meta-analysis doesn't really doesn't really address that because it's, it's looking at markers of uh, exercise like damage, including like CRP, creatine kinase levels, subjective rating of DOMS, so delayed onset muscle soreness, um, perceived fatigue, but none of these things really tie into performance except for maybe that perceived fatigue rating, which I, I do find to be, uh, we do find to be, uh, you know, fairly well substantiated that it, that it can have an effect. Um, so they looked at 99 studies. This was published in the Frontiers of Physiology. They had a sample size of just over a thousand. Um, although when they whittled it all down <laughs> for these uh, for this meta analysis, only 140 subjects were included. Uh, and so basically, the main thing that I think can actually improve or alter uh, uh, actual performance is going to be perceived fatigue. Meaning that I don't care what your CRP is, I don't care what your creatine kinase is, I don't care what you know other markers of muscle damage or or training uh, actually are as far as blood values. I care how you how you think that you feel because that influences your expectations, uh, which influences your performance um, and how you respond to the training anyway. So basically they found that using active recovery made the perceived fatigue worse, meaning that increased perceived fatigue. Massage uh, actually seemed to have a pretty marked effect on altering um, perceived fatigue, meaning it made better. It made it better. The problem was both studies that looked at uh, massage and how it affected the, the uh, test subjects rating of perceived fatigue, they were small. One had seven subjects, one had one subject, um, and, both, uh, and both groups were untrained, which is hard to really te you know, say anything uh, about how does this affect you know, elite level athletes or higher, higher trained athletes. Um, everything else that they looked at didn't, didn't do a dang thing. So I, uh, <laughs> uh, again, this goes back to what I initially said. I think that we need better research on this to firmly recommend things, uh, that influence a potential, uh, parasympathetic nervous system activity or more in general, what we would consider like recovery methods. Um, and this is probably the most important study that, uh, that we'll talk about with relation to this question. It's called Using Recovery Modalities Between Training Sessions in Elite Athletes, Does It Help? This was published in 2006 by Barnett in a journal called Sports Medicine. 
uh, and I'll read this word for word. Uh, the majority of studies examining exercise-induced muscle energy in DOMS have used untrained subjects undertaking large amounts of unfamiliar eccentric exercise, meaning that when we're looking at these recovery techniques, we're looking at them in untrained folks with uh, novel exercises, and so it's difficult to parse out like what the intervention will actually do uh, on trained subjects and their actual performance. So, and they even say that this model is unlikely to closely reflect, reflect the circumstances of elite athletes. Um, even without considering the above limitations, there's no substantial scientific evidence to support the use of recovery modalities reviewed here to enhance the between training session recovery of elite athletes. The modalities reviewed here were massage, active recovery, cryotherapy, contrast temperature, water immersion therapy, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, uh, NSAIDs, which are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, compression garments, stretching, electromyostimulation, and combination of those modalities, meaning that there's no evidence suggesting that those things improve objective performance. Again, I don't care what it does to markers of muscle damage. I don't care what it does to other blood-related tests. I care what these recovery modalities, if done in between training sessions, do to performance uh, and training outcomes. And so far, we don't have any evidence that these things actually work. So what should you do with that? Uh, I think the TLDR is this, if you believe that using a particular modality that is low risk, low cost, and uh, ultimately does not take up a too much of your time, is likely to help you, it's likely to help you. And I think that can be useful from modulating perceived fatigue. I also think that if you are a person who is spread very thin, who has a lot of stress in your environment, in your day-to-day -day life, that taking time out of your day to relax using whatever technique that you fancy is probably a good idea. I just don't know how that actually will affect your performance and training outcomes. And my suspicion is that on balance, it probably doesn't do anything, but if it makes you feel better and makes your life more enjoyable and worth living, you may want to participate in it. All right, now that we've gone way off the reservation, let's bring it back to the next question. Uh, Alfred Valson asks, Hey Jordan, I've been seeing different opinions on how hard you should squeeze the bar when performing most lifts. Brian Alzru has talked about squeezing it as hard as possible, while Jeff Cavallari from Athlean X has said the opposite. He says, don't squeeze the bar as hard as possible. All right. Is there a best way to do it or just preference? Thanks for what you guys do. You are the voice of sanity in the industry. Uh, so the main thing is you don't have a choice. You don't get to volitionally choose to grip the bar as hard as possible or grip it less hard. Uh, it's called anticipatory, anticipatory scaling. So if you see a heavy weight that you, based on your social conditioning, your previous learning, previous experience, etc., etc., if you perceive it to be heavy, you are going to grip it hard and you're going to exert a high amount of force um, against that object. That's what we see. This has actually been studied in grip and lift sort of uh, scientific studies, and I'll link one in the description below. If you think that it's light, you're going to initially apply less grip force to it, less force production by uh, your muscle, muscle, musculoskeletal system in general. Uh, and then if you find out that it's heavy because you're wrong, you're going to basically ha uh, get an error message in your brain. It says, oh, you thought it was light, but it's not. And then it's gonna rev up uh, the amount of motor units that you recruit so that you can successfully lift the thing. Um, so basically you're hypothesizing, you're predicting how heavy is this thing? Um, how uh, uh, much do I, force production do I need to create in order to successfully perform this task? And when you're wrong, your brain gets an error message, just this thing on the fly so that you can do it. It just takes a little bit longer to do that. So it's less of a smooth action. Um, but again, you don't get a choice. You can't say, I'm gonna grip this thing as hard as possible, or I'm not gonna grip this thing very hard. You're going to default to the correct amount of grip strength to successfully perform the task, whether you like it or not. So who should you trust out of those two? Uh, when it comes to this particular subject, neither. Trust your brain. All right, next question. Uh, Robert S. says, what is the barbell medicine con consensus on micronutrient supplementation, uh, such as vitamins and so on? All right. Uh, for people trying to increase their general jacketude, i.e. increase strength, conditioning, work capacity, etc., are there any specific micronutrients you suggest? And if so, is there enough of it in certain foods to get the desired effect or should it be supplemented separately? So I'll start this off and end it with the TLDR. I do not think that for general health or performance that you need to supplement with any vitamins at all, period. Okay. Now let's look at some research. Now most of this stuff admittedly is on health, and I think that 
this is probably, this is where you would actually expect to see a bigger benefit. You know, most people, if they're not resistance training and they're not eating a, what, what uh, uh, you know, most folks who are in the physical culture, they're not eating well, you would expect them to see a rather robust benefit somewhere with uh, taking um, vitamins or, or other uh, uh, minerals, but it's not what we see at all. So a 2012 Cochrane Review, Cochrane is an independent uh, liter uh, research uh, review center. They basically compile all these studies on particular subjects and then publish the information. Uh, so this was on beta carotene, vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E, and selenium. We found no evidence to support antioxidant supplements for primary or secondary prevention. Uh, this is a, 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 a cardiovascular disease. Uh, and then also mortality. So it's uh, uh, beta carotene and vitamin E actually seem to increase mortality and so may higher doses of vitamin A. Um, <laughs> for vitamin B6 and vitamin E, um, this was a British medical journal study in 2013 in addition to two additional uh, Cochrane meta-analyses. This is 300,000 patients. They looked at uh, cardiovascular disease that include uh, death from a heart attack, non-fatal heart attacks, angina, that's chest pain, sudden cardiac death, stroke, um, et cetera, et cetera, found that the use of vitamin and antioxidant supplements were not associated with reduced risk of cardiovascular events didn't really help there. Um, vitamin D, so this is a Cochrane review. Um, 95,000 participants um, over 56 trials. This is a huge meta-analysis. Basically, you needed to treat 150 patients uh, over five years for one additional life to be saved. And even then, the uh, you know that's that's not terribly great there. Uh, there is also in these studies a, a bunch of a huge dropout rate, so that number is not actually very very good. Uh, also, vitamin D three seemed to decrease mortality uh, for those who were living in institutionalized settings, so nursing homes, etc. Um, although, if they're free living in the community, not in a nursing home, it seems to actually increase mortality. And if you treat the number needed to harm is about thirty six, meaning that one in every 36 of those folks who are taking vitamin D uh, potentially could have a side effect, which usually includes kidney stones or kidney disease, which is, in my opinion, not a good, not a good trade-off. So I, I don't think that vitamin D supplementation should be something that we just dole out like candy. I think that if you uh, have low vitamin D, you should listen to your uh, medical provider about replacement and your uh, be subjected to further testing after you've been supplementing with vitamin D for a while to make sure that your levels are normal and then I, you would stop taking it once your levels have been corrected. Um, there's some additional nuance there basically th uh, suggesting that vitamin D levels are controlled by potentially other disease processes, not just vitamin D intake itself. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll post all these studies in the uh, description below. Yeah, I, so the overall thing is I don't recommend that people take vitamins or uh, other, supplement with other uh, micronutrients for performance or for general health unless they have a documented uh, deficiency that requires re replacement. So pass on that. All right. Second to last question, Ward Stanford, I'm really enjoying the quality and the amount of content you've been producing lately. Thank you for increasing your social media presence. Thanks. Uh, my question is on glucose disposal supplements, specifically something like berberine. Do you see any place for it or benefits in a nutritional program for someone who is otherwise healthy and just looking to utilize carbohydrates a bit more efficiently? Do you believe berberine or metformin inhibit muscle protein synthesis by their action of activating AMP kinase? Thank you. So just again, TLDR up front before we kind of dig into the science. No, I do not think that somebody who's otherwise healthy, right, who has no issue with uh, glucose disposal, glucose uptake, blood sugar regulation, et cetera, et cetera, should take metformin or berberine or other glucose disposal agents because you don't need them. They won't work for you. And there are risks to everything. There are no such thing as biological free lunches. So would you be willing to accept a non-zero risk for no improvement? <laughs> I wouldn't. So anyway, let's talk about berberine for a second. This is tr a traditional Chinese medicine from various plants, alkaloid. It's poorly absorbed orally, and, t and when you take high doses of it, it uh, tends to produce GI side effects, a bunch of different ones, cramping, diarrhea, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, it does work on AMP kinase in fat cells, muscle cells, liver, also may be involved in uncoupling. Here's the thing, though. There have been not many, there have not been many human studies done on this period and the human studies that are in the literature are all from really low 
uh, low tier journals, not uh, very well uh, established in, as far as peer review. And I think, you know, there was some promise of this in the 80s. And, you, you know, that's from this one study, Yin et al. basically saw a similar reduction in blood glucose and A1, hemoglobin A1C. Those are two values that we track in diabetics. That it was similar to metformin. But subsequent studies haven't shown this to be like this wonder drug, you know. And you go on examine.com and you read that stuff and they're like, wow, this looks like a panacea of, uh, you know, things it can do. It can lower your uh, uh, cholesterol. It can lower your blood glucose. It can do all this other stuff, cognitive benefits. But that hasn't been played out in the research, especially not with well-controlled studies. And there are risks to taking this thing. And again, you can't get a pharmaceutical grade, you know, thing here. So you're, you're trusting that supplement companies have your best interests in mind which is not a good idea. So, you know, and I think the best data we have on this comes from the Evidence-Based Complementary Alternative Medicine Journal. This is uh, uh, funded by the government. Basically, a bunch of alternative medicine practitioners were um, uh, saying that, hey, if the government wants to, you know, say that alternative medicine is useful or not useful in certain cases, you guys should study it and you need to pay for it. So this is one of their journals. In 2012, they said the evidence for berberine for treating type 2 diabetes should be carefully interpreted due to low methodology uh, to uh, methodology concerns. The quality was low of their studies, small sample sizes, limited number of trials, and unidentified risks of bias within the studies themselves. And I kind of agree with that. I think that there's not enough data on berberine. There's uh, not enough safety data on it to begin with, you know, um, to recommend it, and I wouldn't recommend it for people with type 2 diabetes who have access to more substantiated medications, and I certainly wouldn't recommend it for people who do not have diabetes or other issues uh, related to blood glucose control, so like metabolic syndrome, PCOS, stuff like that. Uh, as far as metformin goes, this mechanism of action is uh, still, you know, being described, but ultimately it, just, it decreases uh, your liver's production of sugar or glucose. It also decreases the intestinal absorption of glucose and improves insulin sensitivity. Actually has some evidence suggesting that it improves muscle protein synthesis in folks with insulin resistance. That being said, if you don't have insulin resistance, um, any documented, um, you know, uh, side effect of insulin resistance, including, you know, a lot of visceral adiposity, so a lot of body fat around your waist, if you don't have elevated, you know, fasting blood sugar, if you don't have diabetes, which is, you know, kind of end stage insulin resistance, you know, that's the, the end of the spectrum there. Why would you take metformin? It's not without risk and it's unlikely to benefit you. So again, PCOS, uh, type 2 diabetes, other things, some things associated with uh, in vitro fertilization tend to benefit from metformin, but just for a healthy dude trying to use carbs better, I don't think that's a valid use of this medication. Whew. All right. Uh, Kevin, this is our last question. I found your channel recently and have been watching, listening to a bunch of your podcasts this past month and really enjoy the content very much. Hey, thanks, dude. Uh, I see that you all claim there is no evidence for things like foam rolling, massage, stretching, etc., to enhance training or prevent injuries. Uh, to be fair, I don't think there's any, there's evidence that anything prevents injuries really, uh, or, you know, outside of, uh, acute on chronic training fatigue, uh, and workload management. So, you know, and maybe getting, and getting stronger. Those are, those are the two things. So uh, managing workload and then fatigue levels as that applies to the workload and then getting stronger tends to prevent injuries. But otherwise, yeah, that just in fairness. All right. Uh, so while this is true, so while you're saying that uh, there's no evidence that things like foam rolling, massage, stretching, enhance training or prevent injuries, uh, he asks, while this is true, wouldn't you be subjecting yourself to an argument from ignorance? Nope. Uh, <laughs> while there isn't any evidence of these things working and people that preach these various techniques, uh, is there any evidence that proves this doesn't work? Yes. Yes. Multiple meta-analyses, studying, um, stretching, massage, foam rolling show that. So it's not an argument from ignorance. It's just an argument based on scientific literature at this time. Uh, could the techniques actually be, be be beneficial, but we don't know why they are beneficial. Uh, I guess they could, but then we would see that they work. Uh, in well-designed studies, but we don't see that. Can the people preaching these happen to get the fact that they do work right, but their reasoning is poor and they get lucky that they are right? Um, again, no, because you would expect them to, you would expect to see an improvement uh, in well-designed studies and you would expect those to be repeated, but we see the opposite. Uh, to draw a parallel argument 
Someone that believes in God can't prove God exists, but an atheist doesn't believe in God and can't prove God doesn't exist. We'll have to save that for another training vlog. This is not the same argument at all because there's evidence that suggests, that shows that these things don't work. And when presented new evidence that shows that they do work, maybe we'll change our mind. But today is not that day. All right, let's pop into the training videos. First up, we've got Stephen Holloway. He's doing 400 for a set of five. Uh, this may be the worst quality video that I've ever seen. No offense to Steven. So, little knee cave on the way up. Looks like you're in your heels too, because your toes seem to be popping up. Yeah, and you adjust your feet there. I wouldn't do that mid-set. Yeah, I can't see depth here either. Main thing is, it looks like you're looking down too close to yourself. And it looks like you're shooting your hips back out of the bottom. So I'd make sure you stay in your knees. Keep your knees a little bit further forward out of the bottom. So don't shift your butt back. And uh, drive it straight up. Yeah, yeah, that, that one for sure. So gaze out a little bit. Keep your knees a little bit further forward out of the bottom. So you don't shift your butt back. All right, this is Joseph Garcia. This is 315. Myron in the pink shirt. <laughs> there is a something in the foreground that is obscuring your foot. So that's neat. That looks a little high. Yeah, these look a little high, and I can't tell if it's just the depth here, or like of the camera. But your bar path looks good, the mechanics look good, it just looks a little high, so I would go a little lower. That's it. Uh, let's see, this is uh, Dan K. I guess this is pause bench, but the bar is still moving around on your chest, so I would hold it a little bit tighter. Yeah, you see how it's moving? And then it does look like the right side is a little further forward than the left side. I don't know if it's just because you're off centered on the bench, so I would check that. And then a touch and go rep. I don't understand. I don't understand. Bolt your rack down. <laughs> Bolt your rack down. Make sure that you're centered on the bench. And then if you're gonna pause, make sure you're pausing. Yeah. Uh, this is Gilberto Tovar. This is 225. Nice self lift off. Notice no clips, because if things go wrong, he wants to be able to dump it. That's fine. Yeah. Watch your shoulders at the bottom here. Ah, that one actually looked okay. The first one you relaxed when the bar was paused on your chest. That looks okay. I think you're touching maybe a little low though, to be honest. I would touch about a half inch higher. Flare your elbow just a little bit more. Yeah, it looks a little bit too close to like a close grip bench to me. But yeah, nice set, nice set. This is Todd Lincoln, it's like 330. Yeah, it looks like you're kind of just yanking the bar off the floor. I know this is like in 144p, which I don't like. The bar looks way off your legs too, so make sure you're squeezing the bar against your legs. And it looks well forward to the middle of the foot. Yoink. Yeah. Yeah, so keep the bar on your legs. Squeeze it off the floor. Yeah. All right, this is 405. I guess I deleted who I thought this was. Yeah, it looks okay. You know, the only thing I see here, it looks like your grip's a little wider than just the start of the knurl, which, so I would move your grip in. Yeah, so it's just on the, at the start of the knurling, just outside your legs. Nice gains of thrown socks. But I can't see your back angle from here. This is not really a great angle to check that out, but yeah, and your hips were a little low on that last rep. So I, I don't know, I would like to see it from the side, but just make sure that your uh, uh, hips are about a half inch higher and uh, and and narrow your grip. That's what I would do there. I think it's Jack Fletcher, maybe. Oh, maybe this is Todd Lincoln with 330. Oh, yeah, my bad. Sorry for that one earlier. Okay, so your hips are too low. That bar is well over, that's over, I mean, that's over your toes. And you can see your hips move up a little bit. Weight's very light for you, but yeah. You can see that your shoulders want to get pulled over in front of the bar and that your hips rise before the bar leaves the floor just a little bit. It's just very light. Bar's well over your toes. Move the bar an inch back in your stance. Raise your hips up. Yeah. But uh, so you could probably pull uh, much more than this. So that was 330 and this is 315. Let's see if you can get your hips, uh, your hips set to the right height. Nope. That's uh, well forward, my friend. And I wouldn't take the breath at the top. Yeah, I would take it at the bottom. Because the idea is that if the breath, the valsava is meant to keep your back in rigid extension, 
if you if the Valsalva is designed to keep your back in rigid extension and you're taking it at the top and trying to reclaim extension at the bottom, you're just fighting yourself, right? So anyway, the bar is about an inch forward. All right, let's see here. Um, make sure you stand all the way up, tall at the top. So finish your pull and move your gaze out. I mean, take the sunglasses off your hat, <laughs> move your gaze out a little bit. Your back's set just fine. Your hip height looks to be fine, but just finish finish the rep. Yeah, stand up tall, a little taller than that every rep, and uh, go from there. All right, so this is the cambered bar squats. This is 365 plus whatever those things weigh. Yeah, I had to do eight sets of five here. And that one's going a little forward. I need to sit back a little further. Just, yeah. The weight's shaking around, that's less fun. Yeah. Notice how I try to rotate my elbows forward on the way up if they flare up. Yeah, just trying to break myself of that habit. And we'll do another video from the front. You look at the knees. Good, yeah, they don't come in, so that's nice. I think if anything, I'd like to push my knees a little further forward. I just, you know. The length of my femurs and the length of my back, it just, it's just hard to do. I would like to set my thoracic spine better too, but I am kyphotic, and uh, on some level, it's kind of just how I squat. All right. Uh, okay, so I'm using the weight releasers here, and just the thing about weight releasers, so you're more, you're stronger with an eccentric contraction than you are a concentric, which would be the way up, or an isometric contraction, which is holding the bar, holding the weight still without any muscle length change occurring at all. So it's very difficult to overload the eccentric portion of the lift without something like weight releasers. Uh, so you're about 120% stronger uh, with weight release uh, on the eccentric than you are on the concentric. So using weight releasers, which I did for 10 triples at 315, so that's 10 different reps with the weight releasers help work the eccentric portion of the lift. And ideally, those strength adaptations, including stiffening some of the soft tissue, um, increasing tighten molecule content within the muscles, um, increasing costamere, which is the lateral uh, 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 proteins that connect the skeletal muscle fibers. Um, those would all be beneficial adaptations. All right, so this is Baraki. This is, uh, what is this, 505? You can watch the plates move a little bit. So you can tell that the bar path isn't perfectly straight, but you know, it is very heavy. I don't, it looks like, is he using a rogue Ohio bar or power bar? Well, I don't know. Still not bad for a set of six. Yeah, I think if I had my druthers, I would try to make the bar path a little, a little straighter, but. All right, so this is six, that's 660, 665. Yeah, not bad. And I don't know why he films from this angle. You know, it's just potato cam. But uh, I think it's 585 for a set of six. I would like to see that lockout a little better. I'm just looking at his knees. Now, granted, it's from this angle, so hard to see. No, that was a good lockout. The second one was not, not as great. Yeah, that was good. Notice his gaze is out. We like that outward gaze on a deadlift helps keep the back set a little bit better. Also sweet cephalic brain vein, bro. All right, so this is 545 from a two inch deficit, beltless. This must be from last Friday. Yeah. I'm just watching the plates, the logos on the plates. I don't see any movement, so pretty good. All right, so this is 585, same, same deficit. Yeah. yeah. I kicked that one a little forward. That's why it was slower. Let's watch the York. Yeah, that one, the third one was okay. The second one just rolled forward. Yeah, decent lockout. Good technique. I'm good on that. All right, so this is 565. Yeah, I think I'd be a little tighter on those three. I think I was tired though. And these are from the actual deadlifts. I don't know, I missed my single uh, video, but so this is a back offset. This is five, 
70 for a set of five. Yeah, so again, from this angle, it's hard to see what the back is doing, but you can you can check out, again, the plates to see if you're kicking it forward or, you know, or not. Um, I think if I could give myself a cue, it'd be to, again, stand up nice and tall at the top. Man, that was all right. Yeah, I'm happy. <laughs> I don't know, my deadlift's been feeling kind of junky lately. This is 407. Nice pause. Yeah, I, I started pushing it back, but you see the bar speed slow down that it kind of went straight up instead of grooved back. So just a little misgroove, but happy to make it. So this is 365. I don't like this little bounce thing I'm doing on my chest. I should hold the bar still. That one's better. Yeah. So it's 365. This is 380. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good. Nice long pause, bars out of the groove, hence the slowdown. So again, bars always got to go back towards the rack. I missed that one up. So anyway, hey, thanks for watching this vlog. You guys are great. Uh, if you want to submit your own video, email them to mediaparbellmedicine.com. Please, please, please make sure that they are portrait, portrait mode, 1080p or higher. Come on, don't make me call you out like I did, Steve. Uh, and then if you have a question you want to submit for the next training vlog, please make it interesting. Send it to mediaparbellmedicine.com. We'll catch you guys next time. Hit subscribe if you uh, want to keep up to date with all the latest information. Like if you dug the video and comment below what you want to see next. See you guys later. from filming. Um, it's a nice one hour Uber ride <laughs> from Hollywood back to the west side. It's a drizzly day here in uh, Venice, California. Uh, anyway, so when you guys see this, the show will be out. Um, hopefully, hopefully you guys like it. Uh, favorite part being on the show was talking about the uh, uh, swimsuit. <laughs> it's kind of funny. And then, uh, yeah, everyone was really nice. It went by way too quickly. I wish I could have talked more specifics about lifting and uh, yeah, but it was cool. The, everyone's super fun, super nice, and uh, who knows? Maybe I'll be on something in the future. But uh, anyway, I'm gonna get packed up. Actually, changing hotels to this other place uh, up the road because uh, I wanted to be back in Santa Monica, so just a little bit up the street. And uh, yeah, so the party continues. Thanks.